It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five, entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome back, Wine to Five listeners. We are so happy you are joining us this week as we're going to play with wine descriptors. You all had a bit to say about this topic, so we are giddy to share your interactions. We are giddy, and not from drinking too much (laughs) either. But before we go any further, we would be remiss if we did not mention that we have an interview with Eric Larson, and he is the Director of Retail Strategy for Cooper's Hawk Winery. So we will check in with him in a little while, and he's even given us his take on today's topic. But let's just get back to it. There is so much out there in trying to help folks understand wine in a way of making them approachable to people. And then this. (laughs) Though showing a rich, classy aroma, this will be wonderful, especially for lovers of filigree, pointillist articulation, rendered with determined length and ultraviolet penetration, a true bubblehead champagne, the nay plus ultra of a jabbing, expressive wine, yet notice the absurdly long tertiary finish. Serious stuff. Okay, Guy found this in his favorite New York wine shop as a descriptor, and he had to ask WTF, ultraviolet penetration. So this is the kind of thing we're going to talk about today, and this is what makes me want to drink. So let's talk about what we're drinking before we go any further. Steph, what are you drinking? I am having uh, the 2014 Cruise Wine Company um, uh, out of Napa Valley. They are Valdegui, okay? And so that's the name of the grape, and it's quite unusual, but its its other name is Napa Gamay. So it also has that light, fresh, kind of light-bodied, fruity flavor that a Gamay Beaujolais has. And I just brought the rest of this bottle home from my lovely lunch at the kitchen in Fort Collins. And I want to give a thank you to Cameron. He, take good, he took good care of us. And I was there with uh, Jennifer Burke from Duckhorn Winery. We had salads and had some wine gab and she loved this wine as much as I did and yeah I mean this was a great way to have a lunch or or what Valerie and I sometimes say a midday drink this is the 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 afternoon drink of perfection Valdegui I love it. I love it. And that's a grape you don't see very yeah, often Yeah, like either. never. I mean, it's from originally from that languedoc uh, Roussillon area of southern France. And mm-hmm. there's uh, a little bit of it grown in California. So when you have a chance to check it out, I recommend you do. I love it. I love it. So I've got a weird grape, too. So this is like Weird Grape Monday. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to attempt to describe it for you here yeah. shortly. But this is actually one of those bottles you look at. And Steph can see the bottle. You look at it and go, I have no right. idea what is in this wine. Unless you can describe it on the back. And this is why wine descriptors are so important. This is a 2009 Damiano Cioli Silene. Damiano Cioli is the producer the winemaker, that's his name. And Silene, S-I-L-E-N-E, is the name of the wine. It's actually a flower. And the grape is called Cesanese. And the appellation is Olivano Romano. And that is from the Lazio region in Italy, which is kind of where Rome is. The Cesanese grape, you may have heard of Cesanese del Piglio. That's another appellation from the Lazio region, probably a little more popular. But there's not a lot of this grape. It's a, it's a pretty restricted growing area. It's about 20 miles uh, from Rome, I think east of Rome. And it's what we call an indigenous or autochthonous grape to that area. This is about a $16 bottle. And this is like drinking a melodic bouquet of damson fruit salad in Canterbury lace chased with petticoats with a torn fishnet stocking doggedness. No, I'm just kidding. No, this is like, this is, I know, right? I mean, if I put that on the bottle, you're like, what the heck? So um, this is great with, on the back of the bottle, it says meats, mushrooms, and aged cheeses. It definitely has that Italian style, that old world earthiness. It's definitely got that earthy kind of smell. It's almost got uh, like a stewed fruit kind of thing. So if you think of like, yeah, because it's definitely a little older. You see the garnet color here. But they call it the Pinot Noir of central Western Italy. So it kind of gives you an idea of the the kind of fruit that you're going to be dealing with. But it's a pretty wine and I bought up everything that our purveyor sovereignty wines had down there. Evars. 
is led me to this. Is there an extra bottle for when I come down? There is one bottle left. Woo! Put my name on it. I could put your name on it. I served it for a dinner that I did for a networking group for a, a like an etiquette dinner they were having. And we served this one. And it was served with a beautiful pasta dish with sausage and whatever. And people that didn't even like red wine liked this wine. Get and out. I went back to Ivar's at Sovereignty the next day. And I bought up everything he had. This was great. And this is like, like next to last bottle. So... Oh Let's gosh. get back to our main discussion topic because yes, okay. we've got some other wine descriptions. So, <laughs> did you want to start with yours right here? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, okay. Here's the thing. I and I've mentioned it in a previous episode. Jay McInerney, who used to write for Wall Street Journal, he, he's he's published a lot of books. He's a great author and he loves wine. And one of the things he's described Mouton saying. The first time he had it was like hearing Nirvana on Saturday Night Live. Okay, here's me going. I don't really like Nirvana, and I, and usually a live on Saturday Night Live is not good. So yes, what does that mean? I mean, is he saying this is a good thing or is he saying it's a bad thing? These wine descriptions sometimes don't really make any sense to the consumer, let alone somebody who's educated. And right? then it, and you're like. I don't even know what we're talking about. So, uh, so I, this is sort of a you know sympathetic ear here on on some of these things. And the other one, and this is a little bit on the you know silly side. How about has anybody ever heard of a wine being defined as liquid Viagra? Do you have to have a prescription for this wine then? That's silly. Well, I don't, I don't know. know. You're a pharmacist. You tell me. I mean, and then and then is that defined by its aroma? <laughs> know what that even means i don't know what it means either i mean it's it's kind of strange but you know there there was a cute caption um in the newyorker.com they had a story and i can post the link but but the author her name's bianca bosker she says and how can one know whether a bottle that the bi-monthly newsletter wine advocate dubbed liquefied viagra pairs better with salmon or pork <laughs> Oh my goodness. You can't, you can't, I just shake my head at that because you're still going, and what are we talking about exactly? (laughs) So I think, I think there's a lot out there on some of these, it could be the back label of the wine that has strange descriptions, or it could be something posted online that you're reading about. But most of the time, you know, we don't know what they're saying. But you know, the whole reason, and if you go back to the aroma wheel, that Ann Noble created. When did she create it? The early 80s, I guess it was. And you've seen that aroma wheel with wine descriptors, guys. That was created to give people a common language, to be Mm -hmm. able to describe wines in terms that people know and understand. So even though there's all kinds of ways of describing those aromas, like the apples, is it fresh? Is it baked apple? You can start associating those things in your head with the kind of wine you may be drinking. But when we get into things like this, is, and this was meant to be funny, but this is a blog called The Silly Side. And this tasting note, this ruby rich delight is packed with mouthwatering sumptuousness with hints of bramble, blackberry, and boysenberry. Okay, that part's not too bad, but then he goes into frankenberry flourishes. All right, we're Frankenberry. All right, I kind of know what that is. That was my cereal of choice as a child, right after Lucky Charms. A treat to open tonight with beef testicles or lamb spleen escabeche. What? (laughs) I know. Also an ideal companion for manic depression. Shows promise to last longer than your belief in an afterlife. And, you know, so, I mean, people will write things like this. And I think this dude was being funny. Yes. You know, but at the same time, a nose of melted plastic burnt toast and deck shoes worn without socks. This one is a true gift. Every sip brings reminiscences of sun tanning after a morning of mosquito bites and family conflict. Great for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Great oh for tonight as an God. accompaniment for anxiety and an uncertain future. Plus, goes remarkably well with the movie Scarface. What are you waiting for? Say hello to your little friend. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> we're just dying over these. Oh my but God. we hear things like this, and then we post on our Facebook page this guy that went through his favorite liquor store and replaced all the wine descriptors on the shelves. Yes. You guys have to read those. Those are hilarious. You know, and of course, those are being funny, but we have had people describe the following. We actually get some input from our listeners. So our good friend, Michaela Hightower, you may remember her from episode 13. She owns a lovely venue down here in Colorado Springs. She describes a cab so- Cabernet Sauvignon once, and I remember when she did this. It was specifically the structure of this Cabernet, and she said the bottle described the structure as being as impressive as the situation's abs. Yeah, and she- Stephanie's got a blank look, and when she first <laughs> said this, I had a blank look because when she was selling wine at Swirl Wine Bar, she goes, anyone over the age of 25 had no idea what the hell the situation was. Since then, we've discovered that was a Charles Smith Cabernet, and it was called Substance, and that was a 2009 release. And that's, I guess, what the description said, which totally is the opposite of what, if you know Charles Smith, and he was like a winemaker of the year, he's kind of like, you know, just drink the stuff. The wine with no BS kind of thing is his thing. So we're looking at that going, well, yeah, that's true. Nobody under 25 knows what the situation is. So if that's your wine description, you got people like Val Googling the situation. And remember, I had to Google a Snooky. Well, what is the situation? Okay, so apparently these are that Jersey Shore show. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> these are characters. And I, I personally i have only seen it in Italy because I had MTV on in Italy, and somehow it made its way over there, sadly, because now that's what they think, you know, of us. But... The situation is, I guess, a bodybuilder. That's his name is the situation. And apparently he's got a six pack. So this wine was supposed to be as impressive in structure as the situation's abs. And I'm like, what? Wow. So I have to go- so if I have to Google that stuff, chances are I'm not buying that wine. But that was just one of those things that I guess it's marketed for people who are like into what they call those guidos. So I yeah, don't know. Yeah, that's a very specific market approach. Apparently so. So that was one example. And then she also gives an example of sometimes your wine descriptions may not be written by people who really know and understand wine. And she also has a clear memory of a woman in Newport. She decided she'd like to make wine. Well, Michaela was invited to a very sensational wine cave. And it was uh, multi-millions of dollars that went into this design, much more like being a cool place to throw a party. And she invited her to taste the wines, and then she handed her the marketing tasting notes that went with each wine. And she said after putting her nose in the glass, she couldn't place any of the nuances. And she couldn't figure it out. She goes, well, who writes these descriptions? Did a psalm write them or a winemaker? And the woman, bless her heart, she claimed to be the writer and followed it up with, pretty good for someone who doesn't actually drink the stuff, huh? (laughs) So the woman didn't even drink wine. She just wanted to make it, and she just found some other descriptions and got some ideas. And now here's this poor, you know, psalm in training going, why why am I not getting these things in the wine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and totally disconnected now. For Like, the experience makes you almost feel like, you know, you're just too far removed because you can't relate. Right, and people need to understand what that wine is going to offer up in the glass. The final thing that I have also from one of our listeners, this is from Brita, and she said the word pedestrian. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard that described a wine? No. I've actually used it to describe a wine that, you know, somebody marketed as really amazing juice and then it ended up being something like eh yeah it's maybe a seven dollar bottle that wasn't all that so dr vinnie i don't know if you ever read the wine spectator asked dr yeah. vinnie but he actually addressed this because ron m from dallas said the same thing he'd heard the term pedestrian wine what does that mean pedestrian is derogatory it means that the wine is plain or simple and i always use it when a wine has been touted for more than it you know really offers up to me anyway that's what that means uh Brita, if you ever hear it again it's just meant it means really that the wine is is just kind of not all that so that is where we were going with this week's show before we really got into the nitty gritty of yeah. um, ultraviolet penetration and liquid <laughs> Viagra. But let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and move on. Yeah. Well, and I want to add one more thing. I wa- well, maybe two more things. Uh, yeah. I did want to say I tend to, instead of using the word pedestrian, I think sometimes I usually say this is a quaffer. Or something like that. Like, I might be thinking it's better. And then when I taste it, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of just a quaffer. And Mm -hmm. some people are like, well, what does that mean? And I'm like, basically, it just means it's, you know, nothing special. Porch pounder, you know, nothing to write about. Not even really very good. I mean, just kind of. It's wine. It's just wine. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, but pedestrian, there you go. That's a new one for me. Okay. 
But uh, there is one one experience recently when when we were my husband and I were recently in Sweden, and I don't think I mentioned this already on the podcast. We tried a uh, fruit, a berry that we'd never tried before, called smultron, and we picked these little bright red smultron berries on the side of the road, and surprisingly we we just enjoyed their sweet strawberry like flavor and the first thing I could think of was this would be this would be the next most snobbish wine comment or descriptor you could ever say as imagine if I said like the Valdegui wine I'm having right now I would say this tastes like ripe smultron on a perfect day. And then anybody who read that or heard that would say, like, I'm talking about Americans, but anybody yeah. really goes, what is a smultron? Like, how would they be able to know what I'm talking about? They wouldn't automatically attach that to a strawberry note, you know? So anyway. No, no, that's, that's like the situation. You're going to yeah, Google that's that like stuff. the situation. I mean, unless you're a Swede and you know what smultron is. You don't know what we're talking about. So well, here's my question for you, Steph. Do yeah. you, when you travel, always just get out of your car and pick stuff up off the side of the road and <laughs> eat it, not knowing whether it's poisonous or not? I, I mean, know. how the hell did you know it was okay to eat? Living on the edge and all. I guess. You know? <laughs> I'm adrenaline junkie. No, uh, actually, our friend said, you guys got to taste this. This is some Smultron, and they don't sell it in the grocery store, but you can pick it on the on the side of the hike, you know, or walk, or wherever you see it, you can have it. And we we're like, wow. Yeah. But anyways, I do want to tell uh, everybody, I was just in Chicago, and I have some great things to share with you um, on this episode. And when I was visiting with Eric Larson from uh, Cooper's Hawk Winery and Restaurant, He told us about his interesting wine descriptor. So we will plug that in for you guys to listen to that interview and enjoy that. But don't go away because we're going to be right back because we got more fun. All right, here we go. Hi, I'm here with Eric Larson and he is the director of retail strategy. Correct. For... Cooper's Hawk Winery and Restaurants. That's correct. And we're at the Burn Ridge location. Burr in Ridge. Burr Ridge. Yes. Burr Ridge location. And we're just outside of Chicago, in the Chicago suburbs. The Chicagoland area. Chicagoland. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so, Eric, thank you for being here. Cheers. Thank you, Stephanie. Cheers. So, tell me a little bit about the Cooper's Hawk uh, winery concept. Sure. Uh, Cooper's Hawk is a, um, you know, full-on production winery and restaurant uh, that started here in Chicago 10 years ago this month, actually. Nice. Uh, In October, 10 years ago, uh, the first one opened in Orland Park, Illinois, which is down in the south suburbs of Chicago. Um, In that time, we have grown to the point where we are uh, about to open a Florida location, Jacksonville, Florida, that will be our 20th location. Uh, So over the last 10 years, we've um, established in quite a few states, and we're continuing to grow and opening new locations uh, throughout the Midwest and the South. Um, But it is a full winery in that we we make all the wine in Chicago. Um, 80% of the grapes are from California, the other 20% primarily from Oregon and Washington State. Uh, And the grapes, or the grape juice is brought here to Chicago. We create the wine and bottle it and, uh, you know, distribute it um, to all of our restaurants. How cool yes. and exciting that the 20th location is going to open. Yes, it's been very exciting to be a part of the growth of the, of the winery and the, the restaurant business. Yeah. Well, so tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you and the winery come together? Sure. Uh, my background was uh, in specialty food, primarily artisan cheese, uh, and, and assorted other specialty foods and charcuteries. Uh, then I branched into fine wine, and uh, I had a wine and cheese uh, retail establishment. Uh, added a restaurant, had that for about eight years, um, and so that's where I got my background in both wine and specialty food and retailing. Uh, I had sold that business uh, several years ago and have been with Cooper's Hawk now three years this month. Nice. Yes. That's cool. So 
I saw something on the website about a Santa Barbara tour, and yes. I think our listeners would be very excited to hear. What is that about? Sure. So part of uh, the whole Cooper's Hawk concept is it's about enjoying life and the lifestyle of enjoying wine and dining and travel, and we've put it all together kind of in one great package um, in our wine club membership. So wine club members go to wine club dinners. They get a monthly bottle of wine um, that's especially, you know, um, created bottle each month. Um, they get opportunities to go to travel and do all kinds of fun things. So this past uh, month, they got back from a really outstanding trip to uh, Santa Barbara, California, where we had almost 50 wine club members go, along with our CEO, and um, they had just an amazing time touring wineries and restaurants and, and all of the great, you know, beautiful area down around Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, really exciting. We just saw that the uh, we will be going to southern Italy uh, this coming spring. So what we tend to do is take one domestic wine club trip a year and one international. So we were in Portugal earlier this year, um, Italy next year. Uh, you know, so we, we like to kind of pick great wine regions of the world, both in the U.S. and internationally, and then take uh, our wine club members to explore them. Oh, wow. That is something to really look forward to, yeah. for sure. Great time. And I love Italy, so yes. that sounds fun. And great wines in Italy, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. All over the country. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing is... What can we anticipate besides the tour? Is there something else new happening with Cooper's Hawk Winery? Yes, in Cooper's Hawk Winery, we are continuing to grow and evolve, um, opening more uh, restaurants. We have restaurants uh, in the coming year that will be opened in Florida, and in Virginia, in Illinois, in Ohio, and and other uh, regions of the country still to be announced. So there's a lot of exciting growth in that area. Um, looking to, as we grow, continue to expand our bottling line. We're evolving our retail product selection. We're always looking at new ways to enhance uh, the benefits of wine club membership. So there's just a lot of exciting things happening in the wine and restaurant world uh, with Cooper's Hawk. Yeah, yeah. I think that is very exciting. Well, I really want to thank you for having me here today yes. and having a nice lunch with you. I enjoyed lunch tremendously. And um, one last thing, because our episode is going to be about funny or absurd, strange wine descriptors. Do you have a wine descriptor that you think is just <laughs> silly, strange, or... I don't know. Well, there are, you know, people get pretty crazy in their, the way they search for new descriptors. I know one that um, customers and guests, uh, people that I've always talked with about wine, always find to be interesting is the uh, one I think many of us have heard of cat pee. Yes. And understanding, like, how can something that smells <laughs> like cat pee be enjoyable? Right. Um, is that but, a good yeah, thing or a bad right, thing? Why would I want to be smelling or drinking cat pee? Right. But um, in the right wine, in the right context, it is a good thing. Yes. So, but as a... As a um, you know, terminology to describe a wine. Yeah. That's been one of the more uh, challenging and interesting ones that I've I would so. say so, too. I would say so, yes. too. Well, thank you, Eric. This has been fabulous. Stephanie, thank you. I've enjoyed. Cheers. Cheers. Cat pee. Yes, cat pee is a very common descriptor for Sauvignon Blanc. But uh, let's talk about our factoid. So our, our factoid, I mentioned earlier that my wine was a really, you know, garnet color, which is my birthstone. So that means I'm meant to be in the wine business. I'm, I'm almost positive. And what, what I mean by that garnet color, it's like a red that's approaching almost a brick or, you know, like a brown color. It's not so much on the purple side, but more on the orange side. What a lot of people don't realize is as a wine gets older, a red wine in particular will get lighter in color and, and approach orange. Right. And white wine, as it gets older, is going to get darker and more golden. So I'll say the older, the golder. Either way, guys, wine is it ages. They both kind of approach brown in their own way. So you can often tell how old a wine is and maybe start associating some of those fruits that have more of a cooked or a stewed or get more of that earthy stuff and more of that spice. Mm -hmm. And as wine ages, a lot of times the color may give way to those descriptors as well. When you see color on a descriptor, if you say something's really gold and if you see it as an older vintage, then chances are, yeah, it has to do with age and you might get some of that more baked apple instead of the fresh crisp apple, things like that. 
But also, mm -hmm. if you don't see that age on the bottle and you see the, the, the color is gold, then chances are it's spent some time in wood. So you're going to get some of those maybe vanilla, spicy butterscotch notes often associated with white wines that have been aged. So that's our little factoid that as wines get older, red wines get lighter and white wines get darker. Yeah, it's so simple, but I, you know, it's so simple. It's good that yeah. people to, to realize that because it's a good clue just by the color. Absolutely. Now, if the white wine is actually brown, chances are, guys, it's not good. You probably want to dump it. Give it a smell. It's probably going to smell like, you know, wet cardboard or, you know, maybe something kind of funky, like, you know, maybe the go back to the fishnet stockings. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Give it a sniff. But the color is a clue to the wine and probably how long it's either been aged in wood or in bottle. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. I yep. like that. Yeah, so, hey, Steph, you've got a shout-out from this week. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so back to the Chicago trip, two things. I got to spend some time with one of our loyal Wine25 listeners, Douglas Trapasso. Thank you so much for setting up our lunch date. We shared a delicious Italian pizzas, pasta, and some rosé bubbly and had a great time together. That was wonderful to meet you. Awesome. Yeah. And and the other thing I wanted to say is I went to the Langham Hotel in Chicago and upstairs they have the Travel restaurant. And Justin and I sat at the bar and this was a recommendation from my friend Emily Kimmy here in Greeley, Colorado. And she knows her food and wine and blogs about it on Feeding the Famished. And she said to go check out this place. We sat at the bar. Kevin and James took care of us. They totally know what they are doing, okay? Impressed with craft cocktails and the cocktail I got specifically, I, I was thinking of you guys, Wine25 listeners. It was a wine-based cocktail called the Midnight Train to Portland. And it had Pinot Noir, espresso tequila, pear wine, and aromatic bitters and then right on the side was a lemon head candy and that was a nod to how espresso is served with a lemon rind in a lot of coffee espresso situations like in Italy we yep. have a lemon yep. so mm -hmm. so that was to honor that tradition of having a coffee drink with lemon and so it was so cool those guys are doing it right. They were very entertaining. And I want to especially thank thank James for the lesson on snakes. I had no idea that some snakes give birth to live babies and don't lay eggs. <laughs> for real. Good to know because we have a, a baby, um, some kind of snake in our backyard. I don't know. Oh, really? He's kind of a, he's kind of a pet. I don't know. He lives under the, the sage. <laughs> things i'm not into that that herp thing but right, right. but yeah that's that's good to know you got a snake lesson i got a snake lesson and it had a beautiful wine cocktail i mean last week we were talking about fall wines right autumn time and everything and this coffee based wine cocktail was totally up right, exactly what we were talking about i mean that's totally he they nailed it so very cool wow. check that place out in chicago and what's on your radar val I've got something pretty cool on my radar. This thing is called a Vinny bag. And we're not talking about Val. You know, I think sometimes when I say Vinny bag, they think they mean me. But no, <laughs> Vinny bag is actually a product. And it was reviewed in Cook's Illustrator. We subscribe to that. We use a lot of their recipes. And what they do is they test a lot of gear in Cook's Illustrator. Well, they tested a bunch of different wine bags, including the neoprene ones, the wine skins that I have like six of them, mm -hmm. you know, that I put in my luggage. And they packed them in suitcases. They abused them the way the airlines would, you know. They even rolled the luggage down the stairs. And Vinny Bag does this on their website. So the reviews were awesome on Bed Bath & Beyond. So you can get them there. So it's this inflatable bag. You can put your, like, china in it. They, they showed a porcelain vase ah. getting stuffed into a bag and thrown down the stairs. And that's on the Vinny Bag website. And it kind of conforms to whatever you're shipping. Nice. And then it's inflatable. And it's kind of a high grade plastic that inflates around it and they've yet to have a bottle break so these things run about 28 to 30 dollars it is a woman-owned company which i think is really cool and it's called alesco and here's their uh their mission their simple rule or their tagline it's to live by the simple rule of be nice and have fun oh i love that 
Well, I love it too because that's the same thing with wine. Yeah. Just be nice and have fun. Yeah. You know, some people are just so cutthroat, and there's just no need for that. So I, I love them. They tweeted right back to me. I'm definitely going to get one for an upcoming trip that I have. It's going to go from California to the East Coast and back. So I'm definitely going to put some bottles in there and and test it out. But that is on my wino radar. The Vinny bag. V i n n i bag. So you can go to vinnybag.com or get your little coupon and go to Bed Bath and Beyond and hook yourself up. Oh, Val, I'm glad you shared that because that is something that was not on my radar and I have a lot of those other gadgets and bags and things and uh, this sounds like a a very cool solution. So It looks really, really cool. Which And, and that brings us to uh, next week. I am so excited about next week's stuff. Yes, we have a special guest for next we week. And yeah, we've got a Master Sommelier, one of 230 master sommeliers in the world and she will be here with us on wine two five that is really exciting so it's going to be a good show we're going to add if you have a question that you would like to ask a master sommelier that you may be a burning question definitely post it or email it to us as always our time has gone zipping by but we would love to hear from you so speaking of email you can connect with us at wine t-w-o-f-i-v-e at gmail.com if you have a burning wine question for our master psalm or connect with us on facebook you can also connect with steph on twitter at alborello soap and on the alborello soap facebook page you can find val on twitter at wine gal unboxed and also on the vina with val facebook page and on instagram yes and we are all about sharing the love and speaking of the love we are overwhelmed by the number of reviews you guys have posted thank you so much everybody we have a five star review from wine newbie one and she says quote Steph and Val bring a new light to wine and other spirits for people looking for a little insight education or some fun facts wine two five is a great show thanks ladies a joy to listen to you both and that thank you I know isn't that great that is so sweet. I see. It's just, be nice. Oh, and have fun. Be nice. Have fun. <laughs> I have love some that. Wine. <laughs> yeah, and then we have another review from F Hearts. Uh, she also graced us with a five twinkly stars and says, "Quote: Every episode is like popping a bottle of bubbles. I enjoy the refreshing content of Steph and Val's topics." They are knowledgeable about wine, and I look forward to the weekly episodes. Cheers, ladies. You know, I just love that. Every episode is like popping a bottle of bubbles. I mean, that's pretty close to the truth. I mean, what we do, but at the same time, I want to pop bubbles just reading this. I mean, maybe we can get her to write our show notes. Oh, I seriously, that would be great. I mean, I, I, having... Some content from people is so fun to incorporate into the show anyway, so definitely. Let's just share one more. Uh, I have one from uh, Shelly Bond, also a five-star review, and she says, quote, Great show with lovely ladies and love hearing wine talk. Steph not only brings the fun and personality to the show, she follows it with a punch of info. She follows it uh, with some factoids. Val is a fountain of wine information and brings it close to everyday life with a solid wine background. Everyone could use a little wine to five in their life. Everybody could use a little wine to five in their lives. Absolutely. (laughs) Oh my gosh, you guys, thank you so much for your words and for your stars. And most importantly, for listening and hanging out with us so we're not, you know, just sitting here drinking and talking to... (laughs) talking to nobody in particular and that's kind of what keeps our content going and fresh so definitely let us know reach out to us on facebook check us out on twitter we have a pinterest page we've got a brand new youtube channel with one whole video on it we'd love to hear from you but until next week cheers cheers. thank you for listening to the wine to five podcast be sure to check us out at facebook slash wine two five And tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.